So we're working through the, I'm calling this the Assyrian Empire, we're not there yet. But Assyriologists, as their call, have basically divided Assyrian history up into various eras. We looked at the first four of these, at least to some degree, last week. And so just in the spirit of a little bit of review here to remind you of what we've talked about, Assyria began, begins really with just a city, and the name of the city was Asher. And Asher is in the north of Mesopotamia on the Tigris in the region that today would be part either of uh, Iraq or possibly Iran, but that's the uh, general vicinity in which we would find that the ruins of that city, as far as I know, are still there, and you can visit them, but there's no major population there at this point. So it begins as the story of a city. The city is able to establish its independence after the fall of the third dynasty of Ur that took place around 2000 BC. That story we went through last week. We noticed that the next era is called by Assyriologists early Assyria, and this is that 200 years or so in which now we begin to see Assyria extending itself and becoming not simply a city, but a region that was to some degree influencing and indeed in some cases dominating the regions that surrounded this. And this would be the era that we refer to as the period of the judges. And so you recall last week we were saying that the Assyrian, the king of Assyria, allied with Supalalumus, the king of the Hittites. They were able to squeeze out the Mitanni. This is all review, so it should ring a bell in your mind if you were here last week. And on the basis of that, they were able to expand their domains to some degree into at least, you might say, the backyard of Israel. But that didn't last for too long, and Assyria kind of goes into a period of decline along with the rest of the ancient world in what's sometimes called a kind of dark age. And so this is a pretty well attested uh, aspect of ancient Near Eastern studies that for a couple of hundred years, you just don't hear much. You don't hear much from the Assyrians, you don't hear much from the Babylonians. The entire ancient Mediterranean world seems to go dark, at least to some degree, with the notable exception, of course, of Israel. And we were saying last week that at least appears to be an illustration of Proverbs 17, 6, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And in some grand sense, that seems to have been what was happening in the ancient world during this time frame. That brings us now to this period that's called the period of recovery, which begins about 9-11. Somebody asked last week of 9-11, do you think there's any correlation with that and 9-11? I don't think so. But anyway, uh, about the year 9-11, uh, we have this kind of re-emergence now of Assyria, and this is the time frame that leads toward empire. We still haven't seen an Assyrian empire yet. That's the last of these eras. But this is the period that's heading toward empire. It begins in the year 911 BC, and there's several kings. We've looked briefly at each one of them. So I'll just remind you again, the first one is Adad Narari. This is where the recovery begins. Uh, this is when Israel now divides into two kingdoms. You have Rehoboam and Judah. You have Jeroboam in the north. We talked about that last week. Then we have Tekulti Nanurta, who is the one who is distinguished mainly, is rebuilding the walls of the capital of Assyria. Then you have Ashur Paul, who is the one who really establishes a new paradigm for Assyrian conquest, namely ferocious, vicious, brutal, gratuitous violence. They really just wanted to terrify their enemies into submission, and they were pretty successful at it. And the descriptions that we have of the particular tactics that they used really will be pretty convincing, I think, to any casual reader, that people would just have a tendency to go weak in the knees, you know, and just simply allow these Assyrians to bully their way in. And this is the guy that really distinguished himself as establishing that as in a, in, almost in a new kind of... Uh, outlook altogether, this sort of violent kind of methodology. The guy that we left off with was Shalmaneser III. He is most famous from our point of view because he leaves us this, uh, this really impressive artifact from the ancient world known as the Black Obelisk. And the Black Obelisk is, is, is really well known and, and of interest to us and people interested in the Old Testament because for the first time we have a pagan nation leaving an image of an Israelite king. 
And so it really is very highly confirming of the basic narrative of the Old Testament because it, it fits so nicely with what's otherwise known from the Old Testament point of view. And that Old Testament king, of course, was Jehu that we're going to be uh, considering again just for, uh, briefly. So Shalmaneser III, that's where we left off. I want to pick up the story there and press forward basically to the time of Jonah. So you notice Shalmaneser rules until 824, as I said earlier. Jonah probably came to town about 780, so we're about 50 years prior to Jonah. So I want to, in some detail, talk about what's going on here that leads us to the time of Jonah. This is an uh, image, a statue of Shalmaneser that's found at the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. He left quite a few of these pictures. There's some at the British Museum as well. I mentioned last week, in 35 years, he launched 31 campaigns. That's a lot of war. That's what he's doing. And the effect of that was to greatly expand the Assyrian holdings. Now, this doesn't become an empire yet, but this darker green region is simply to say all of the places that are within that dark outline were paying tribute to Assyria to keep out of further trouble with them. In other words, they were willing to pay money to not have the Assyrians come to town and do horrible things to them. It's not quite straight up rule yet, but it's very close to it. So we don't quite call this empire, but it certainly is heading in that direction. And Shalmaneser III is the guy who was able to establish that much broader kind of region under which they were uh, exercising that kind of control. There are two occasions when the Assyrians came specifically to Syria. Now, I, I, I didn't clarify this last week, and someone asked the question after class, and I thought to myself, I need to say this. There are two words we're using here, Assyria and Syria, and they're not the same thing, right? Assyria is this imperial presence in the ancient world that we're really focused on right now. Syria is a small region, a country north of Israel, with which Israel had ongoing relationships over the years, sometimes combative, sometimes allied, but Syria is a fairly small area just to the north of Israel. Syria continues to exist to this day, as you know. The capital is Damascus, and it still shows up in the news uh, these days. So Syria has continued to exist throughout history. Assyria is gone. There is no Assyria anymore. It's been swallowed up largely by Iran, and uh, related countries. And so uh, I'll try to pronounce clearly and distinctly so you'll catch the difference between the two. I know sometimes uh, that can be a little bit confusing. So my arrow here on the map is to say that the Assyrians came in and attacked Syria. Assyrian annals indicate that, and we also have corroborating evidence of that from the Old Testament itself. That attack took place, it's one of those 31 attacks, in the year 853. That would be the same year, by the way, that Ahab, the king of Israel, a wicked king, married to Jezebel, that's the same year he died, but it wasn't in that conflict. The other time that the Assyrians come and attack is in 841. So two times, two of those 31 campaigns really come into the region that we're interested in, into Palestine generally, and especially there is an attack on Syria. That second attack in 841, the king in Syria was a guy named Haziel, or Hatziel, and he had just assassinated his predecessor, Ben-Hadad. Both of these guys are mentioned prominently in the Old Testament. They are both also mentioned in Assyrian records. Ben-Hadad was a Syrian king who had ongoing battles with Ahab, the king of Israel, Hatziel assassinated him and took over and was immediately confronted by this attack from the Assyrians. And basically the result of that was he wound up under siege in Damascus. Shalmaneser uh, did not actually take Damascus, but it did take control of the surrounding area. Jehu, the king who was at this time ruling in Israel, decided the better part of valor at this point was simply to agree to pay the tribute which he did, and that gave rise to this black obelisk that we looked at a little bit last week. The last few years of Shalmaneser's rule were tied up in civil war back in 
uh, Siri itself, so he kind of goes dark the last few years as he's trying to do some damage control in his own region. Now, what's happening during his reign? What I would like to do as best we can is while we're thinking about these Assyrian kings, also ask what's going on with the people of God. So we're going to keep our eye on two different balls here as we're proceeding, and we'll notice the intersection of these two stories from time to time. But during the reign of Shalmaneser, we have a fairly complex series of events that take place in Israel and in Judah, the divided kingdom. This is the only good chance, the only good excuse I'll have to cover this, so I'm seizing it right now. So you may recall this from Sunday school lessons you had 100 years ago. Maybe you went through some of this stuff, but at least now we'll have a chance to try to put it into its context. So in Judah, who's ruling? Jehoshaphat. I always thought that was a funny name when I was a kid. Jehoshaphat. I don't know. Anyway, he's a good king. Gets a good positive review in the Old Testament with the one exception that he allows his international alliances to align a little bit too closely with the king who is ruling in Israel, whose name is Ahab. And you know the story of Ahab. He's married to Jezebel. Jezebel is a Phoenician woman, princess. She, by the way, is attested to outside of the Old Testament. Uh, and she brings her pagan religion to Israel and really greatly influences Ahab. So Jezebel and Ahab get very negative reviews, as you know, in the Old Testament. Jehoshaphat permits himself to become allied with Ahab through marriage in which the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, a woman named Athaliah, or Athaliah, you may pronounce it, becomes married to Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram. And that does create a little bit of an interesting story that unfolds here in Israel during those years. Ahab is killed in 853, as we indicated earlier, in a battle that he has with Ben-Hadad. So he dies. This was predicted by Elijah the prophet at the time because of his wickedness, because of his manifest idolatry and so on. He is going to be judged by God, and he dies indeed in this battle. It's that famous incident where it says a, an archer shot an arrow at random, and of course it struck Ahab simply to say there are no random events, you know. And that arrow was aimed very precisely by a god of providence, even though the guy that shot the arrow didn't know what his target would turn out to be. The successor to Ahab is his son, Ahaziah. Ahaziah, this is a very odd story, I think, in itself, was working on his back deck and fell through a lattice. I think it was a pergola he was trying to put up there. He just fell down. And he injured himself pretty badly, and so he actually dies of his injuries. This is also just about the time that Elijah, who had been the great prophet in Israel, the first great prophet, is taken up into heaven. You know that whole story, swing low, sweet chariot. Well, he's taken up in a fiery chariot. That would be about the time frame that this takes place, during the reign of Ahaziah. Of course, the successor to Elijah is Elisha, and he will play into the story a little bit more as we go along, and uh, as I indicate right here. All right, back at the ranch in Judah, we have Jehoram, who is the son of Jehoshaphat. He is married to Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, and she is cut out of the same mold. She is a vicious woman and is every bit as wicked, I suppose you could say, as was her mother Jezebel. Jehoram shows the influence of his wife by doing what was prohibited to Jewish kings, but was commonly practiced in the ancient world otherwise. And that is, once he became the king, he wipes out the entire family, all his brothers, anybody that might have been a threat to his claim to the throne. So he wipes out his whole family. It's a, it's a wicked deed, and the Old Testament condemns it, even though it was commonly practiced in surrounding nations. He is, as a result of that, attacked. And there's a coalition of uh, rulers that come against him, including Edom, the Philistines, and the Arabs. In a kind of united assault on Judah, they sacked Jerusalem. That seems to be the backdrop for the first two of what are called the minor prophets in the Old Testament. As we go along, I'm going to try to 
tuck into our story where the minor prophets fit. Sometimes it's hard to figure out just where they go, and so I'm going to try to include them along the way for you who are jotting this down. So Obadiah and Joel both seem to have been prophecies that were written against the backdrop of this attack against Judah during the reign of Jehoram. They don't say it specifically, it's more or less an opinion that's held by many scholars and I tend to agree at this point that they've got it right. Obadiah is written directly against the Edomites. It's a condemnation of them, presumably because of their gratuitous attack on Judah. Joel, of course, is well known for a couple of things. He talks about a great attack of locusts, which some people believe should be taken literally. Some believe it's a metaphorical description of this attack by these Edomites, Philistines, and Arabs. More importantly, Joel is the one who is quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost when he's construing the meaning of speaking in tongues, and he says, that, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, you recall. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will see visions, etc. That whole thing is from Joel. So, but both of them seem to show up about this time. Jehoram himself uh, died of horrific uh, uh, disease uh, that goes, uh, it's described somewhat uh, graphically in the Old Testament, but he dies in 841. 841 is a critical year, so we'll keep our eye on that date. And what happens is that his son, ah- Ahaziah, or Ahaziah, it may be pronounced either way, takes the throne. You'll notice he only rules for one year. So what happens here? The successor to Ahaziah, who dies after he fell through the lattice, is his son, Joram. I'm sorry, the names are similar. I didn't write the, you know, it's just... So you have an Ahaziah in Judah and an Ahaziah in Israel. To make matters worse, you've got a Jehoram in Judah and a Joram. I mean, come on. But anyway, that's just the way it is. I'm not going to argue with the Bible, but those are the names that come up. So we have Ahaziah in Judah and in Israel, the north, Samaria, we have Joram. All right. 841. Recall that's the second attack by Shalmaneser. Joram orchestrates a united front to respond to that attack. Haziel, who's the king of Syria, Ahaziah, who's the king of Judah, and Joram themselves, they go to battle and they have at least some modest success holding off Shalmaneser first time out of the gates. However, Joram is injured in that battle, and so he goes back to his capital city, which is called Jezreel, in Samaria, the ten northern tribes, to recover from his injuries. While he's there, he's visited by his ally, the king of Judah, Ahaziah, shows up with flowers and candy, you know. How you feeling there, brother? They have a little visit, everything's going fine, until a guy comes galloping up with his army behind him whose name is Jehu. Jehu is a commander of the armies of Israel. He has been anointed by Elisha and told, you need to go and wipe out the entire family, everybody that's left of the family of Ahab. They were so wicked, they left such a bad imprint on my people that I am authorizing you now, Jehu, commander of the armies of Israel, go and kill Joram and all the other descendants of Ahab. So that's the authorization he receives. So that's where Jehu shows up. He's not part of the royal family, but he is uh, a commander. So he comes and he attacks Jezreel at the very moment that these two guys are meeting and having high tea, you know, sitting there, and all of a sudden, along comes Jehu. And he kills Joram, which is what he was instructed to do, but then he goes beyond the scope of his instructions and also kills Ahaziah. So Jehu comes and wipes out the king of both Judah and Israel, and that's in 841, and it corresponds with the same time that Shalmaneser had attacked, and it's sort of in response to that. All right, so Jehu takes the throne now. Uh, He's wiped out 
uh, the sons of Ahab, 70 sons of Ahab. He kills Jezebel, that famous scene where she's thrown out from the window and drops down to the street below and her carcass is eaten by dogs. You remember all that? That is in the Old Testament. It's very ugly, but anyway, I think she deserved it. Uh, and so... Uh, Anyway, that's, uh, that's what Jehu does, and so he's fulfilling all of God's requirements at that point. But because he also killed the king of Judah, which he was not authorized to do, Elisha gives a judgment against Jehu that he will only have people on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Uh, that is to say there will be three successors to Jehu himself, which does in fact turn out to be the case. Now it is this Jehu who now in the in the, against the immediate threat of Shalmaneser, who's the, obviously a much bigger threat, decides that the smartest thing to do is to pay the tribute that's being required, and that gives rise to the black obelisk that is dated precisely to these events. And so again, it's a, it's a remarkable coincidence of ancient external history with biblical narrative that we have this, and we talked about the black obelisk last week. All right, meantime, in Judah... Ahaziah has been killed by Jehu. There's nobody right at the moment to take over. Ahaziah was a young man. He has three or four sons. The youngest of those sons is only about six months old. So what to do? The wife of Jehoram, mother of Ahaziah, the same Athaliah, or Athaliah, the daughter of Jezebel, seizes the throne. And there's an interregnum period at this point. It's the only time in Jewish history when, Ju when uh, Judah was ruled by a female, and she for about six years is there. She's not a legitimate ruler, but she, and she doesn't take over in the spirit of, okay, I'll just kind of manage the shop until the legitimate heir to the throne is old enough. No, she wipes everybody out, you see. She kills her own ch grandchildren. She wants the throne. She wants power. She's the daughter of Jezebel, cut out of the same mold, the only one who escapes this purge is that little six-month-old baby, and he is just spirited out secretly and hidden away under the care of the high priest at the time, whose name is Jehoiada. And so for about six years, she's running the shop there in Judah, and Joash secretly is being protected under the care of the high priest for a few years. Well, in 835, there's a coup. Ath Athaliah is uh, executed at that point, and that brings then Joash, who's about an eight-year-old boy, to the throne, and he becomes the next ruler. He is the true seed of David, and through the protection of the high priest, he is able to survive this ugly time in, Jewish, in, in the history of Judah. He's a very good king at the beginning, However, when the high priest who had protected him and cared for him, Jehoiada, dies about 20 years later or so, Joash begins to go sideways. And so even though he starts very well, as long as he has the influence of Jehoiada, he remains faithful to his um, you know, standards and call, but then toward the end he begins to deteriorate. He does several things which are bad policy, one of which is he bribes the king of Syria not to attack him for this and a lot of other things he is eventually himself assassinated. And so in 796, Joash goes under, and that's the end of the events that happen in, among the people of God during the reign of Shalmaneser III. All right? So now the next king, the next Assyrian king, is Shamshi Adad V. He rules down till 811. He leaves some nice pictures of himself as well. They all look alike to me, as I've mentioned, but there you are. This is a uh, stele of uh, uh, Shamshi Adad at the British Museum. He had to settle the civil war. I mentioned that earlier in Assyria. It takes him two or three years to do that, as is often the case when the central power is in a kind of upheaval, there's rebellions everywhere, and this guy comes out vicious on steroids once he's got his civil war under control, and so he just ups the ante, and things get even worse, more violence, more bloodshed, more hostility, uh, more outrage around the Mediterranean world under this guy's rule. In Judah, Joash continues to rule all through this period. In Israel, Jehu continues to rule until he dies in 814, He's followed by his son Jehoahaz, 
rules for a few years there, 814 to 789. He is not described very in much detail in the Old Testament. The main thing we hear about him is he's in constant wars with the king of Syria. So that's about as much as we can say about him. The next king in, in, uh, in uh, Syria is Ada Narari III. He rolls down to, eight, uh, to 783. Remember, Jonah is 780. Okay? So he rolls down to 783. He goes even further. He gets as close as anybody has to date to true empire. He imposes heavy tribute on Syria, on Anatolia, the region of Turkey there, Phoenicians, Philistines, Israelites, Edomites, the Medo-Persians, and many others. The entire world now is pretty much paying under duress tribute to this guy. And this is the point where it appears that Assyria is gaining this momentum to become absolutely dominant of the entire Mediterranean world. They're already dominating for sure, but they're kind of on a trajectory that would suggest that they'll become just an imperial power uh, within a very few years. What's happening in Judah? Joash is continuing to rule in Israel. Jehoahaz dies in 8 and 789. Amaziah comes to the throne in Judah, 796. Jehoash in 789. Amaziah defeats Edomites in a war. This is a local skirmish, but he's successful. He loses a war to the Israelite king Jehoash. Interesting story. I don't have time to go into it in detail, but basically uh, Jehoash has an ongoing struggle with the Syrians. This is what's happening kind of at home during these years. This is when Elisha reaches the end of his career and he dies under the reign of Jehoash there, uh, sometime toward the end of his reign. The next king that comes is Jeroboam II. He rules in Israel, and it's a re rather remarkable thing. He is the greatest king to rule over Israel. It's a time of considerable peace, which is unexpected. So that's part of the story we want to focus on. It's also a time of ease and some prosperity. So Jeroboam II has a lengthy reign and probably, by most people's measures, the most successful reign of all of those who ruled over Israel, the, tor the ten tribes on the north. All right, now this brings us to Shalmaneser IV. Shalmaneser IV is the king who, by, I think, best measures, was the king who heard Jonah preach. He rules from, eight, uh, from 782 to 773. He has just inherited an empire which is strong and getting stronger, which is continuing to use increasingly violent means to extort from all of their neighbors the revenue that is making Assyria very, very wealthy at the expense of all of those that are under their dominion. So that's what's going on. That's what this guy inherits. And one would expect that that would be the ongoing kind of momentum of the Assyrians. And so it's very interesting, he comes to the throne, he's the son of his uh, predecessor, that he is remembered later as weak and inept. Now, let me just say something here. He leaves us no records. All of these guys were just filling their annals with all of the boasts of their powerful, glorious conquests. Everyone was outdoing the last one. Everyone was selling himself as the, as the next great, greatest king yet. And then all of a sudden comes this guy, you would think he'd be riding this wave, and he goes dark. We don't hear anything from him. What we do hear are later Assyrian comments about him people who actually were even more violent, more warlike, reflecting back on their predecessors and say, this guy was a loser. Well, maybe he was a loser, or maybe he simply repented and decided that the kind of campaigns that had been carried on by the Assyrians were not the kinds of things that they should be involved in. This is pure speculation. I want to say that right up front. We don't have anything from this king, Shalmaneser IV, that says this weird guy came to town and preached a sermon and we all repented in sackcloth and ashes. We don't have that. 
We don't have any indication that Jonah was ever there. We wouldn't expect to have it, you know. This wasn't a time when detached history was being reported in the way that we've become accustomed to since the Greeks. It's just nothing. But it is very interesting, and I think at least highly consistent with a view that would suggest that something dramatic happened in the history of the Assyrians to cause them to just deflate with respect to their warlike kind of tendencies. And so basically this guy is quiet. And I'm suggesting to you, it's been suggested by others, not my private opinion, that this at least, though it's an argument from silence, I grant that, nevertheless is at least consistent with the message that we have from the Old Testament that Jonah preached and the people repented, particularly, it's mentioned there, of their violence. So I'll let you make your own judgment about what uh, you want to do with that. Anyway, uh, what's happening back at the ranch? Well, Judah is ruled by Amaziah, as I was saying, and uh, Israel is under Jeroboam II. Jeroboam II is ruling over Israel at a time of great prosperity. This was unexpected because we would have thought the Assyrians would be there giving them grief, but the Assyrians go, as I say, just go dark. They don't show up at this point, and it gives Israel this great reprieve and a, a time of great prosperity. Unfortunately, they don't acknowledge the prosperity very well, they don't acknowledge that it's God who's given them this. They don't acknowledge that it was Jonah's preaching and God's providence that protected them from the threat of the Assyrians. Rather, they just presume on God's grace and use it as an excuse to drift off in the direction of disobeying God, of disregarding their covenant obligations. And so it calls forth two prophets, minor prophets in the Old Testament, the first of whom is Amos. If you know anything about Amos, you know that Amos was a... Uh, you know, what a sheep herder in uh, Judah, but he's called by God. He famously says, I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But nevertheless, he goes to Israel and he preaches against them specifically with respect to the kind of casual life that they're living, this time of prosperity and ease. He condemns them for being at ease in Zion, that famous line that comes from Amos. He also refers, I think somewhat humorously, to what he calls the fat cows of Bashan. Not very complimentary, of course. He's talking about the women who are just gorging themselves in a life of ease and indulgence. And Amos, kind of rude, but that's what he calls them. If you don't believe me, just read Amos. It's there. You'll find it. And otherwise, Amos is a wonderful prophet for people to read who are living in times of relative peace and ease in their Christian experience. Amos is a very relevant book, I think, for any Christians who are not facing probable death day by day, you know. If we lived in China, we'd have a very different kind of faith experience than we do living in Spokane, Washington. And sometimes I think we need to hear a little bit more of Amos sometimes. But anyway, he's the... He's the first of these two prophets. The other one is Hosea. Hosea is a remarkable story. You, call, you recall he's told by God to go and marry a woman of the streets, marry a prostitute. Many people have thought that can't be. This must be metaphorical, and I don't know, maybe it is, but the story doesn't seem to be metaphorical. It does seem to be what God actually told him to do, and it's what he did. He marries a woman named Gomer, and she had been a prostitute. He takes her into his home, cares for her, but after a period of time, she leaves and goes back to her prior profession. And that becomes this amazing object lesson that's used through the voice of Hosea to say, this is what Israel has done. She has forsaken her covenant husband. She's gone back to the streets, back to a kind of spiritual adultery and idolatry. And the story of Hosea is, in a sense, intended, calculated, to say this is what God is dealing with, with his people. And so both of these, called minor prophets, Amos and Hosea, are prophets that come to Israel during the reign of um, Jeroboam II. All right, so that's the story with, with Shalmaneser IV. As I say, he's, we don't know much about him. He just seems to be a quiet kind of guy. Interestingly, his successor is very much the same. Very little is known of his rule. He's very quiet. And so we have, once again, kind of, you know, all peace on the Western Front here. In Judah, the next king is Amaziah. He's followed by Uzziah. You may recall that 
Isaiah the prophet was commissioned to be a prophet in the year that King Uzziah died. So we're getting close now to the era of Isaiah. This is in Isaiah chapter 6. Uzziah was a pretty good king, but of course he um, arrogantly presumed to enter into the temple on one occasion, wanting to play the role of the priest, even though he was a king. You're not supposed to confuse those offices in ancient Israel, and for that God struck him with leprosy. He died a leper. You may recall that story of Uzziah. In Israel, Jeroboam II rules until 753. He's followed by Zechariah, who rules for a few months. He's the fourth generation from Jehu. He's the last king of the line of Jehu. He's followed by Shalom, who reigns for about six months, followed by Menahum, who reigns for about 11 years. Okay, just to kind of connect the dots, remember that Israel, the 10 northern tribes, are deported by the Assyrians in 722. So we're within about 20 years of the deportation of the 10 northern tribes. And we begin to see a whole lot of political instability, of course, in Israel as we are nearing that particular era. So I'm going to uh, leave off uh, talking about him. The next king, uh, we'll be getting back to this next week when we actually talk about this uh, deportation of Israel and, and ongoing uh, thoughts from there. The third successor is also quiet. This is amazing. Three kings in a row. Nothing. They're just quiet. What happened here? How did this happen? I like to call it the Jonah effect, you know. He rarely left the palace. He was killed in a palace revolt in 745. And in 745, we have a great shift in the whole story. For about 35 to 40 years, Assyria just flatlines for no good reason. You read, you read you know, ancient Assyriology and you say, why did this happen? Nobody's got a good explanation. I've never, went, I've never read anyone yet from a secular point of view, saying it must have been the preaching of Jonah. But at least the evidence is there for anyone's interest that may want to look at it, you know. Uh, so this is what's going on. We have Uzziah ruling in Judah, followed by Jotham in Israel. We have Menahem, uh, and he is going to be the king who is mentioned in connection with the, the, the first king of what's called the Neo-Assyrian Empire, Tiglath-Pileser III. I'm going to leave off the story there and just have a couple of comments about Jonah. What do we learn from Jonah? Number one, this is my Sunday school lesson for the morning, you know. Number one, point one of three points, when God calls, obey. Delayed obedience is disobedience. That's something good for parents to know with respect to their children, it's also good for Christians to know that with respect to their God. When God calls you to do something, and you know he's called you to do it, the best thing is don't put it off till tomorrow. You may meet a whale, you know. And so, when God calls us to do something, as he did with Jonah, the, the, the direction of prudence is obey. Second lesson, even when we disobey, God provides I've heard people say that the whale came along as some kind of punishment. No, no, no. The whale is redemption. You know, the fish is redemption. Jonah would have died, but for the fish, you know. And so God sent in his providence this wonderful picture of an ark. And many have noted the similarity that we see going clear back to the Garden of Eden, this kind of ark motif. Noah's ark. Mo Moses in the ark there in the river and so on, this idea of being protected in the midst of swirling waters. And you read the prayer of Jonah that he prays from the belly of the whale, and you see how he's giving a prayer of thanksgiving for God's deliverance. And so when we do disobey, it doesn't mean God will abandon you, it just means that you may, you know, run into a big fish. So there you are, and you can give thanks for that if it should happen. The third lesson and last one that I want to leave you with from Jonah is never underestimate the power of God's word. Jonah did not want to preach to the Assyrians. He didn't like the Assyrians because the Assyrians were notoriously violent, idolatrous, wicked, evil, horrible people. 
And when God said to Jonah, I'm going to send fire and brimstone on the Assyrians, Jonah was ecstatic. The last thing he wanted was for God to give them mercy. It wasn't that he didn't want to go to the Assyria because he was afraid of the Assyrians. He didn't want to go because he was afraid God would make good on his word. And that's exactly what God did. And it did make Jonah very upset. You recall chapter 4 of Jonah in that connection. I bet that when Jonah walked through the streets of Nineveh, he preached some of the most lackluster sermons you've ever heard. I bet that those sermons were so deadly boring that it would have put any of us right to sleep. But God can fill, I mean, you, can you imagine him walking through, 40 days, God's going to get you guys. Better watch out. You know, he's just hoping no one will hear it because he doesn't want mercy for the Ninevites. But even that lackluster sermon, even that sermon that probably wasn't filled with prophetic passion that we might have expected is what God was able to use to change their hearts. Make God's word part of your conversation. When you're talking with your family, when you're talking with your coworkers, when you're talking with your friends across the back fence, shoveling snow, whatever it is, when you have an opportunity to incorporate, even in the most innocuous fashion, references to the word of God, never underestimate how powerful that can be in the lives of those who hear it. God's word does not return to him void. You don't have to be eloquent, you don't have to be, you know, have the whole Bible memorized, but we all know enough of the Bible to incorporate, to just pepper a little bit of it into our conversation. And you can bank on the fact that God will use even those modest incorporations of his word to accomplish things in the hearts of the people that you encounter. And I think Jonah, at least to some degree, teaches us that as well. I've